I'm so sick of my ambition, wishing I could be so brilliant, terrified it won't happen for me. Hard to find by algorithm, we're just victims of the system. How did we end up playing the game? Bonjour, my name is Alice. Welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to talk about female rape. I'm not your good girl, I'm not your babe, and I will paint this town I've already said it multiple times, I do not have TikTok. I solely rely on my sister's TikTok weekly report to understand what's going on there. I don't have TikTok, but I have Instagram. And one thing that I know is that when a trend reaches Instagram reels, it means that it's a pretty big deal and that I need to make a video on it. I'm joking, I mean, half joking, to be honest. The video that reached my Instagram Explore page was Danny Alda shouting with a group of women. The trend now has a name, female rage. The representations of female rage aren't new. As we'll see in the video, they stretch back to a very long time. One of the reasons why this is becoming more trendy is because female characters are becoming increasingly complex. We're progressively stepping away from the innocent women versus strong women binary to explore what it means to be an average woman, a toxic woman, a queer woman, a black woman, and so on and so forth. Female rage is more often than not connected to toxicity. Mina Lee has made an entire video focusing on the psychological aspects, mental health aspects of that toxicity, namely how unproductive and self-harming it can be. So I'm building up on what she has said in the video to continue the conversation and focus here not so much on sadness, but more on anger. Because there's a big difference between a woman who displays sadness and a woman who displays anger. You know, the first one is acting emotional, but she's still womanly. I don't think anybody would say that Lana Del Rey is unwomanly. Quite the contrary. With sadness, what we consider as femininity is preserved. On the other hand, women who display anger are seen as bossy, unattractive, unwomanly. They have lost their femininity. And it's a pretty big deal in a society like ours that still revolves around the gender binary. In fact, when you think about it, a woman who refuses to shut up might lose job opportunities, she might not be perceived as girlfriend material, marriageable. In an interview done five years ago, Uma Thurman was asked about her opinion on the recent events, and by recent events we mean the Winstein affairs, and you can tell that she's angry. You can see her clenched jaw. It's hard in that type of situation to not feel angry. Angry for the women who have spoken up, angry about yourself for not speaking earlier, angry about the other directors that continue to be praised despite showing clear signs that they are just as problematic. I'm not gonna lie to you, I got angry a lot of times while I was researching, writing this video. I still get angry when I watch a movie directed by them, you know, the great directors of our era, and see how they continue to sexualize kids, teenage girls, and only look at young women through a hyper male gazy lens. In France, Adèle Anel, who you might know from Portrait of a Lady on Fire, expressed her anger by leaving the César ceremony right after Polanski, who's been accused of essay, earned yet another prize. And guess what? People did not like it. On the other hand, Thurman was praised in magazines, newspapers for containing her anger. And we sure could have anticipated to that. We know we behave correctly when we don't shout. And again, that's not limited to women. We'll connect the dots um, at the end of the video, don't worry. Feminist scholar Amia Srinivasan put a phrase on it um, so we can better understand it. She called it effective injustice. It's defined as the tendency to incite the victims of oppression, to let go of their anger, to facilitate better discussions, to bring about the end of their oppression. You know, it's the typical, hey, why are you getting angry that you've been systematically oppressed and abused for centuries? You know, I'm not responsible for all of that, so can you just calm down so that we can have a productive discussion, okay? Effective injustice. You have to regulate your emotions in order to partake in respectable people conversations. And that reminds me of a poem I read recently from Langston Hughes in the context of racial segregation in the US. It goes as follows. Go slow, they say, while the bite of the dog is fast. Go slow, I hear, while they tell me, you can't eat here, you can't live here, you can't work here. Don't demonstrate, wait while they lock the gate. It's the same thing with climate change, you know? Why is Greta Thunberg shouting? Can she just calm down and open a discussion, or is it too much to ask? Does she think she's better than us? That she knows better than us? She probably can't even tell the difference between a beach leaf and an oak leaf. That's an argument I heard recently by the anti-climate activist Mr. Nature here in France. Common sense people, listen to the wise men. Oh. <laughs> 
In fact, the growing popularity of female rage is a direct response to that. It's not so much a rebellion against patriarchy, but more against the effective injustice it creates. It's like we hate patriarchy, but we hate even more that we can't say that we hate it. What I found interesting though was that men created the first stories of female rage. You ready to hear about those juicy stories? <laughs> Let's go for it. The first story is that of Thais, the 4th century BC Greek Etheria. Ether it's a sort of ancient sex worker for high value people. And she instigated the burning of Persepolis in resolution of a 100 year grudge. Another story that a Patreon and friend shared with me is that of Kanagi, a Tamil woman who put fire to an entire city as a form of revenge against the unjust murder of her husband. Kanagi is described as a chess woman who remained loyal to her husband despite him cheating on her by using her own money and jewel to pay for a dancer he fancied. That's a wild patriarchal story we've got here. And then he comes back to her, she still loves him. He gets wrongly accused of having stolen the queen's anklet, gets beheaded for it. She hears the news, goes to the king to prove him he wrongfully killed her husband. The king can't bear it and literally dies of remorse. The queen can't live without her king and dies as well. And Kennedy puts the city on fire after advising the old, disabled and kids to evacuate. Because even if she turns into evil woman mode, she's still a social justice warrior who cares about the people. Honestly, that whole story is so much better than great tragedy. So yeah, these were the stories that were written by men and you can feel it in the way they are written, structured. If we jump in time to the 1970s, horror movies, slashers like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre are getting popular, they are directed by men and they also show few female panic, female rage, and sometimes violence. But they rely on a specific trope, the final girl trope, which describes the last woman standing, the one that deserved to live after everybody has been killed. And interestingly, she's usually a pure virgin woman. So now what happens when female rage is written by women. Let's go back in time a little bit to 1968, the year my mother was born and the year where Valérie Solanas published the SCUM Manifesto. The SCUM in SCUM Manifesto stands for Society for Cutting Up Men. Here's a passage from it. Life in this society being at best an utter bore and no aspect of society being at all relevant to women, there remains to civic-minded, responsible, thrill-seeking females only to overthrow the government, eliminate the money system, institute complete automation and destroy the male sex. Men are trash sounds very conservative compared to that. So let us politicize female rage by showing one, where it came from, men, patriarchy, um, and two, where it should be directed to, again, men, patriarchy. Researchers Shani Orgat and Rosalind Jill described female rage as having a moment. And I feel like the scum manifesto perfectly encapsulates that. Solanas really had her moment with this manifesto. One thing I found really interesting though is that both critics and feminists were quick to reassure people that, you know, the scum manifesto is fiction, it's a fantasy, um, don't believe it, it's not true. It's coherent with the current depictions of female rage that almost entirely happen in the context of a horror movie where we assume that everybody is a bit mad anyway. In other words, female rage is accepted, entertaining, only when we know that it's not real, it's only ironic. It's fictional. But what is happening on social media right now is different. Creators, women are starting to connect different occurrences of female rage and create something out of it. So the Gone Girl segment, for example. Cool girl is hot. Cool girl is gay. Cool girl is fun. Cool girl never gets angry at her man. She only smiles in a chagrin loving manner. Added onto or connected to clips of Midsommar, Pearl, Jennifer's body to create a pattern, what is now referred to as the good for her trope. The good for her trope is about legitimizing revenge. You've been hurt, abused, now is your time to get closure, now is your time to retaliate. It's deeply cathartic to watch these movies. Now the problem, I mean, it's not a problem, but we have to remember that catharsis, since the Greek tragedies, serves to purge the audience from sins, fears, etc. In the context of female rage, cathartic movies serve to create a space for that anger to exist. But ultimately, the goal is for you to leave that anger behind and find peace, to go back to life and live hand in hand with patriarchy again. In other words, female rage as it exists today is a more radical version of something that has existed for a very, very long time. The female complaint. 
Berlin defines it as something which operates as safety valves for surplus female rage and desire. Thus, the female complaint constitutes a space of resistance to the messages and practices of patriarchal dominance, while implicitly foreclosing any action to change the fundamental conditions of the complaint's production. It's a complex way to put it, but basically it's the exact same thing as when you start a conversation with a friend on, for example, the rising cost of university tuitions, and you understand there's something wrong there and that it's not in your power, but the conversation ends with a, well, that's the way it is. The female complaint and its more radical form, female rage, are turned inwards. They are depoliticized and can therefore become toxic. As I've mentioned earlier, Mina Le talked about the mental health consequences of nurturing sadness and anger in a depoliticized way. Similarly, in a TED talk on female rage and resilience in the modern era, author Molly Carame shared how angry she felt after her postpartum body completely broke down. Very quickly, she directed her anger towards men who didn't have to deal with the consequences of pregnancy or pregnancy itself. She said, women's bodies suffer at the ends of men and then suffer bringing the next generation. And we're all okay with this? May said that she expressed her anger by becoming violent, by doing everything she could to make her husband feel sorry, including sticking urine-soaked pads that she had to wear because of incontinence on the wall um, as a sort of artwork. Like, we can all agree that what she did was very toxic. May's message is that what she did then was absolutely pointless and unnecessarily harmful. What she preaches now is that female rage be redirected towards something creative, towards external action. That story really is TED Talk material, isn't it? <laughs> so what does creation look like? Well, let me read you something and tell me how you feel about it. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room, just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my oftenest offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Now tell me this poem doesn't want to make you stand up and do something. The poem is titled Still I Rise. It was written by the talented Maya Angelou. It has been used by feminists, black activists, and the Upgrade Your Mindset channel as well. <laughs> After reading that poem, you want to ask the same question as journalist Rennie Edulodge, namely how best can we join the choir? When we are filled with rage, how do we use that anger? To that, Jess Phillips, a Labour MP member, says, basically organize. The feminist movement that has been going all my life and long before I was born, they changed stuff because they were organized. They joined up with other women and used their voices. Political action is the answer to female rage. Supporting feminist organizations, protesting and sharing anger with other women, educating yourself and others on the topic. But before we think about how to organize that anger in a productive way, we have to take a few things into account. And the first one is language. In Over His Dead Body, Vanessa Frieden argued that most women still do not have the language to express their anger, disappointment, outside meticulous rage or revenge. In fact, academic terms like patriarchy, gender equality, internalized misogyny, effective injustice, are all quite elitist in a way. And by that I mean that they are still not accessible to the majority of women. When you think about it, women who don't spend a lot of time on social media, or unfamiliar with that academic language, can actually struggle to put words on the inequalities, the injustices they face on a daily basis. You know, the most common form of female rage outside movies, etc. is basically a mother getting mad at her child. She's not going to tell her disrespectful kids that she's suffering from patriarchy, a system her kids have internalized and reproduced by not considering her like the person in charge of everything in the house, including their mental health. When you have no words to articulate that anger, you shout, goddammit! Using feelings, the body as language, and you know, it's not limited to women, uh, feminism, there's a lot of academic literature on the politics of the body, the body as the weapon of the powerless. Well, when you have nothing but your body to protest, hurting yourself or hurting others with yourself is your only weapon. That's why it's important that we have concepts and that those concepts are democratized so that people can relate to them, use them to articulate their anger. 
Speech is powerful, just as powerful as anger. And when the two are combined, you have everything you need to start a revolution. One last thing before I let you go. If you look at the different examples we have used today, you might have noticed one thing. The depictions of female rage on screen are overwhelmingly white. That's where intersectionality comes in. Some women's anger is more acceptable than others. And the way I see it is that, yeah, sure, we are afraid of angry white women, but we're even more afraid of angry black women. In France, it would be maybe more relevant to say angry Muslim women, precisely because of their intersectional identities. We read Maya Angelou's poem through a feminist lens, but we could have read it through a black activist lens. In fact, Maya Angelou's poem is special because it's a black feminist poem. It denounces both sexism and racism patriarchy and white supremacy. That is too scary for many in a way that, well, we'll stick with the angry white woman, okay? She's not as compromising. To conclude, I would like to highlight that um, what we talked about throughout the video is applicable to many other forms of oppression, class, race, gender, sex, etc. Those who benefit the most from the status quo will do anything they can to force you to contain that anger, to depict you as a mad person, to paint you as irrational. You know, we haven't talked about the fact that uh, women's anger is often brought back to their hormones. Um, but anyway, if you had to remember just one thing from this little video is that your anger isn't coming from nowhere and that when it's paired with the right discourse, it can seriously move mountains. Again, I advise you to look into how you can best channel that anger through political action, organizations, action-oriented art as well. And yeah, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, the conversation continues in the comment section. Don't forget to like, to subscribe, if it's not done already. I would like to thank my Patreons for their support. If you want to support me and join the Discord chat we have, uh, we also have a book club, we do live streams, etc. You'll find a link in the description box. And shout out to the top tier Patreons, Donage, Alex, Manuel, Dakota, Jay, Sam, Benjamin and Oswald. And I almost forgot Perry. And yeah, I'll see you next week, probably. Salut! Critics and feminics. Feminics. <laughs>